This is the story of Good Friday from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, a translation called The Message. They took Jesus away. Carrying his cross, Jesus went out to the place called Skull Hill. The name in Hebrew is Golgotha, where they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side. Jesus was in the middle. Pilate, the Roman governor, wrote a sign and had it placed on the cross, and it read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was right next to the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, and the Jewish high priest objected. Don't write, they said to Pilate, the king of the Jews, write, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate said, I've written what I've written, prophesying unknowingly. When they crucified him, the Roman soldiers took his clothes and divided them up four ways to each soldier a fourth. But his robe, his undergarment, was seamless, a single piece of weaving. So they said to each other, let's not tear it up. Let's throw dice to see who gets it. This confirmed the scripture, quote, they divided up my clothes among them and threw dice for my coat, unquote. The soldiers, unknowingly, validated the scriptures. When the soldiers were looking after, while the soldiers were looking after themselves, Jesus' mother, his aunt, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood at the foot of the cross. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her, and he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that moment, the disciple accepted her as his own mother. And Jesus, seeing then that everything had been completed, so that the scripture record might also be complete, then said, I'm thirsty. A jug of sour wine was standing by, and someone put a sponge soaked with the wine on a javelin and lifted it to his mouth. And after he took the wine... Jesus said, it is done, complete. And bowing his head, he offered up his spirit. It's probably not that hard to imagine what it must have been like for Jesus' friends and family and disciples to see what they were seeing, this leader of theirs, this life of theirs being crucified. This can't be happening. He's so young. I mean, he gave us so much hope and understanding and love and life and had so much more to give. I mean, wasn't there a way to avoid this, to prevent this horror from happening? Some way to save him. I wonder if God the Father also felt all of those things only infinitely more than any mere mother or fo follower would. Like a parent in an emergency room having just been told that their son, their young son, has died. An infinite and immeasurable universally immeasurable sense of grief God must have felt. And it occurred to me, talking to all these emergency room doctors over the last month and a half, that maybe God felt a little bit of what they would feel when a patient is lost. I mean, surely God has the power to change history. He made history. And holes, we talk Sunday after Sunday, everything. So God could have called in 10,000 angels and rewrote the story. He could have avoided the pain and the suffering and saved the patient. 
talking with all of these emergency room doctors about what they do, medical professionals, physicians who are called to act, to do, in my mind, to be God's hands and saving hands and hearts and minds in the ER, in the emergency department. People who live at the moment, the nexus of life and death. I'm thinking, surely they know something of the heart of God at the nexus of life and death, the focal point of our Christian story, the Easter weekend. Like I said earlier, I first connected because I thought they'd help with the resurrecting heart of God part, but was totally surprised how they, through their stories and their way of engaging God's world, were a pointer to his broken heart as well. Emergency room doctors are those who are the, they are the people that we expect to have the power to save a life when a life is hanging in the balance, who sometimes don't. It's a terrible feeling to go and speak to a family, to let them know that despite all the technology and the medical interventions that we have at our disposal, that their loved one has died. And that same doctor told me this morning about that 35-year-old man who dropped dead in his office downtown. 35 young family had to phone his wife who was making dinner that night with her little kid and say he's not God knows in some mysterious like way what it's like to have to make that call. He could have saved him, but didn't. Couldn't. Didn't. There's a lingering brokenness there, another doctor writes. That's tough, and that stays with you for days. In the moment, another doctor, when a patient dies, the biggest thing I'm thinking of is how I'm going to tell the family and how they will react. How can I make this awful moment a little less awful? After the encounter is over, I have to just carry on with the rest of my shift as I'm also in the middle of looking after several other patients. When I get home, though, it's pretty much all you think of, all day and all night, for one day, two days, maybe more depending on how difficult a case it was. I personally spend a lot of time thinking, should I have done this or that different? If I'd given that drug earlier, would it have made a difference? If I would have got that central line in faster, would it have helped? Etc. Etc. I spend a lot of time questioning whether I should be an emergency room physician after all these difficult cases. And when I first read her words, that last quote, I was in tears for her. Do you ever think about our emergency room doctors in this way? The beauty of her self-giving love was overwhelming and life. In these very difficult cases, and this is true for all physicians in a way, but every emergency room doctor, she and her team give a bit of their lives in many ways. They risk something of themselves in order to save the patient. Do we really have any idea what our eternal infinite God had to bear on Good Friday when his co-eternal son, whom he has been in relationship forever with, perfect love flowing between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to have that ripped out of your life, to lose him. I wrote back to that doctor said, reading your words over again started to choke me up a bit. All I could think of was, thanks for taking the risk. 
and for paying the cost so that badly broken people can at least have a chance. You're, you're, you're their last best chance physiologically at that point. You are forced to carry the downside of that risk. In a way, you put a part of your life on the line, psychologically and spiritually, when you enter these kinds of circumstances. It makes me think of how you're very much like Jesus in that way. And love is always a risk, an emergency room love too, I guess. Jesus laid down his life for others all the time. You're like him when you do that in your way, in your place. You're like him. Self-giving suffering, in my mind, is a universal principle when it comes to saving. Giving up your life so that others, you, can live and have a life. You and your family can live now and then one day perfectly forever and have a life. Someone paid a huge price. Only, as I said, the suffering that God felt is infinitely more than a doctor or a parent. One of the things that came up talking to all these doctors is uh, this idea that, yeah, we're the last chance. Our teams are going to be it or not. <laughs> Our decisions, right, in the moment, fast, moving, doing, place. And yeah, sometimes it doesn't work and people die. Even with all of our medical technology, we can't save everyone all the time. And I think, yeah, God choosing allows the same reality to happen and therefore must be ever suffering and all suffering at the loss of life that could have been prevented. God feels it for all who die in all circumstances, in whatever room, over all of time. Emergency room doctors have to put a boundary up so that they can do their work, otherwise it would kill them. You have to have this professional layer in between you and the people you work with. God doesn't. <laughs> So his suffering, in a way, is personal every time anyone dies, let alone when his son Jesus dies. They have to do it, the doctors, because it would kill them. It's almost as though there is a veneer or a screen between who I am as a person and who they, the patient, are as a person. And maybe that's what has to happen in order to be objective. Or another doctor. It's easier to take care of someone when they aren't humanized in some way. If you don't have a personal connection or develop that personal relationship with that patient, it makes it a bit easier. It is that personal connection that I think makes losing someone hard. When we're trained, or maybe this is my coping mechanism, to distance myself from people. I can empathize with them or with their family, but I don't take they're on their problems or issues. It's what makes me effective and helps me survive or at, or at least last in this profession. It is also this that I think limits me in terms of connecting with people, she writes. I don't want to get too close or feel too much. And they're only human, and they can only get so close and feel too much. And if they got too close, they would die. And is that not a microcosm or a pointer to a God who got too close? Like, could never forget you. He'd never forget your name. Never forget making you when the earth was being created. Could never forget a son that he's known forever. Risked getting that close. No professional deity human being boundary and suffered as a consequence. It almost killed him, I'm sure. Can you imagine God's pain on this Good Friday day? His feelings of loss 
and the suffering that fills his heart. It's one thing for a doctor with her human limitations to unwillingly lose a patient and suffer as a result of that, but for an infinite God to willingly lose his son. What, what, you tell me what that kind of love is. And you tell me who is worth expending that much pain. You are worth expending that much pain. For you alone, he would have done it. Yes, God knew that three days later, and so did Jesus know that three days later, the story would change in a dramatic way. And Jesus knew, he knew before ever going up onto that cross, taking it up. When he went to visit a dead friend named Lazarus, he foreshadowed it. This sickness will not end in death, he said. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. The mystery of suffering leading to glory is this faith that we're living. And to unbelieving religious leaders, Jesus said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights, only three days and three nights, in the heart of the earth. And again, he said, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Every death, your death, will, if the Lord tarries, bring suffering and grief to the heart of God. On every highway and every emergency room department and every hospice and every place over all of time. And all of those deaths that fill our universe are caught up in this three day story, this gospel death, and in two days from now, resurrection story. In those three days, God is a long suffering God. And God is your, our only hope when facing death. 